So thank you again for the invitation, and I try to share with you uh, some perspective on, on clinical translation of flash therapy. And um, the first aspect is maybe, uh, do we have enough uh, data to support the clinical translation of flash therapy? Um, and then the first thing to ask ourselves is, uh, what about the normal tissues? Uh, so the, the striking observation there is that there is a consistent uh, relative sparing of normal tissue which was observed in different circumstances. Uh, the first was in various types of tissues, in mice especially. Um, and then this effect also was seen in several animal species, uh, cat, mouse, pig, zebrafish, uh, also with different types of beam and energy uh, with electrons, X-rays, and protons. And now it has been shown also um, across several institutions in Europe or in the US. Now, regarding the effect on tumors, what did we see? Uh, overall, I think there was no suggestion of a sparing effect on tumors, uh, either in mouse models, xenographs, or autotopic models, or also some no suggestion of tumor protection in the phase one veterinarian clinical triad in cat, in cat patients. So that's what we have for the tumors at the moment. Uh, there may be some potential limitations for the clinical translation. So uh, we've seen we have good reason to do it, but now how can we do that? Um, to observe a flash effect in the preclinical setting, uh, there has been essentially um, small volumes of normal tissues. Uh, so the effect was seen in these particular circumstances where a few centimeter cubic normal tissues were irradiated, um, mainly but not only with single dose, uh, and the effect is more obvious above seven or 10 gray. Um, so, and the overall treatment time has to be below, somewhere below 100 milliseconds. Or maybe 200 milliseconds is still possible to see the effect, but probably shorter. Um, so then if we have these three types of limitations for clinical translation, uh, what about the effect in large volumes of normal tissues? So that we don't know at the moment whether we are going to see the same amount, same magnitude of sparing effect in large volumes. So this is something we, we need to explore. Second aspect, uh, regarding the use of fractionation with flash. Uh, I think this is also something we need to explore more in details, knowing that there may be some very interesting interaction between fractionation and flash. And the third point regarding the overall treatment time, there immediately we have technical challenges, especially to obtain such dose rates in large fields and in deep-seated tumors. So uh, technical challenges on one hand, and the other thing is how uh, will we be able to modulate the dose in such a short time scale? Because we certainly don't want to get rid of optimal conformality when we are going to use flash. So this is a bit of a problem there. The, the, the other issue for clinical translation is what about the magnitude of the flash sparing effect on normal tissues? What we know is that it's probably variable. Uh, it may be generally between 20 and 35% of the dose that appears to be spared. And um, it may be different from each type of tissues and organ at risk. So this will need to be explored in the coming months and years to know more about that. So the magnitude we, we may see it's 1.2, 1.3 modifying factor. And is it clinically meaningful? 
So I've just taken the example here of the work presented earlier by my Catherine Vosna, uh, which is uh, an experiment, a very a seminal experiment, which was done on the, on the back on the skin and the back of the pig. Here, as you can see, if you have not already seen the publication, we have spots here on the right where the dose given was the same as the spots on the left. Uh, here on the left, it's conventional. Here on the right, it's flash dose. So we are nine months post radiation therapy, late effects. And here there was a spot at 25. We didn't have a spot here at 27, but if we try to extrapolate the potential gain here, it can be up to 1.36 dose modifying factor. I think if we get that protection in normal tissues, it's probably going to be very, very interesting clinically. Now, if we are more close to 1.2 or, or less, it's probably going to be less spectacular when transferring this in the, in the clinic. So we don't know exactly how it's going to be, but we would like to see something at least 1.3 or higher. Uh, the other thing, and I think uh, Raphael Muckley mentioned that, for clinical translation, there may be additional safety measures that are needed because of, it's going so fast that you want to stop the beam uh, exactly after the number of pulse you, you need. So. Uh, in addition to what we do with a normal Linux, we probably need independent pulse and time counter device for beam stopping. So we've been using that in, in one patient, in fact, so far. Uh, it proved to be feasible from a technical point of view and safe, uh, giving 15 gray, which is not that a high dose, but it's still 15 gray in one fraction, and you see 90 milliseconds, so it's very fast. And we didn't get any uh, unexpected side effects, uh, and the tumor durably uh, disappeared. So the clinical translation uh, is ongoing at the moment, and this was mentioned by Marie-Catherine, uh, so there is a, a randomized clinical trial ongoing with uh, Lausanne and Zurich University uh, and the Z Zurich Veterinarian School um, for small uh, limited tumors of the nasal planum. They are randomized to standard of care radiation therapy versus a single dose of flash, 34 gray in 20 milliseconds. Um, for the clinical translation in patients, in our patients, um, we have also some initiative, especially here in Lausanne. Uh, the first will be with electrons, and uh, especially with patients with skin cancer, where we have two trials that are uh, about to start. We also plan to have an IORT trial starting next year and also high energy electrons uh, for uh, being able to do flash for deep seated tumors in large fields. Where, as I said before, we have a real challenge here, um, a technical challenge. So the first clinical trial that we have, we are really about to, to start, will be done with flash Mobitron, which was described by Raphael McLee. Uh, it's, it aims to treat multi-resistance melanoma, skin metastasis. Um, we were going to do a classical three by three dose escalation trial, starting at 22 gray single dose, uh, up to 34 gray, which is a, a dose, um, as you saw, which was used in, in the CAT patients at the moment. Uh, so it's really a, a phase one with DLT, uh, maximum tolerated dose to be determined in two cohorts. One will be patients with small field irradiation, and we have a second cohort for larger fields. The second trial, which is uh, about to start, is a randomized phase two study 
for basal cell cancers and squamous cell cancers of the skin. Again, with a flash mobitron, uh, we will randomize the patients between flash, single dose, and uh, a more fractionated regimen, uh, as um, mentioned in the MCCN guidelines. Here we have a, pro a composite primary endpoint, which is combining toxicity and tumor control, and independent blind of the review. Uh, now, if we want, just before finishing, maybe to see what are the key research questions for clinical translation. What do we need to know? Uh, we need to know what are the optimal key parameters for large fields, and whether it's going to be the same as the one we've been using for um, small field irradiations. Um, for the, so the, the, the key parameters may be dose per pulse, number of pulses, overall treatment time. Uh, the other aspect is what about the dose modifying factor? Is it 1.2, generally speaking, 1.3, slightly more? So we don't know. And um, we probably expect that it may be specific or different for each type of tissues and organ at risk. So that's a certain level of complexity that we have to deal with. And if we integrate a flash dose modifying factor in our treatment plannings, uh, at which level of dose modifying factor will we see an equivalent dose distribution that could be superior to conventional IMRT or IMPT? And this, obviously, we don't know at the moment. This is absolutely key, because we need to be better uh, to expect to have a, a, real, a real added value of flash. Uh, among the other key questions, uh, one is about the toxicity from radiation therapy. We know that the toxicity of radiation therapy is essentially due to the high dose levels that are just close to the GTV, uh, in fact, that are close to the PTVs, or even inside the PTVs, where we have normal tissues there. So here we have uh, big questions, because the magnitude of the flash sparing effect of normal tissue in the vicinity of the GTVs, how, how much is it? Is it the same as what we've seen before when there is no GTV? in the field, and especially what happens in the CTV and in the PTVs in terms of sparing of normal tissues. So that's an open question at the moment. The other thing, we don't have good reason to think that isolated tumor cells in the CTVs could be spared by flash, but still, it remains to be demonstrated. Uh, the next question is about fractionation. Uh, because we know that flash effect is more um, pronounced at high dose per fraction, we are talking about maybe 10 gray, which is typically a, a dose that we would like to use in the clinic. Um, and here, uh, it may expand the use of high dose per fraction, uh, because we will get additional benefit from a flash sparing effect. Uh, on the other hand, is there any gain when we are using two gray per fraction, maybe two gray per fraction in a single pulse? That we don't know, and this remains to be uh, studied because then we could perhaps combine conventional fractionation plus flash in large field irradiations that would also enlarge the therapeutic window. And finally, my Catherine to understand more about the background of flash and how we also to combine flash with other modalities. We have mentioned that we could combine it with surgery, even intraoperative radiotherapy, which is typically using a high dose per fraction and a single one. So it's a really good indication for flash. Uh, it, but also we need to ask ourselves what about combining it with immunotherapy or other uh, cytotoxic or sensitizing agents. And with this, I will finish 
knowledge, uh, knowledging the, the team uh, in Lausanne, and you saw today three of us, Marie-Catherine Vosnin, uh, Raphael Mecli, and here we have a picture. It's probably not updated picture, but a picture of the team here in Lausanne. Uh, plus a number of partnerships, as you can see here below, and Entrahop is certainly a very, very strong partner for us. Thank you very much.